Thanks, Doug. The, the older I get, the more valuable, valuable to me are the people I've known for decades, like Doug, like so many of the faculty here. Um, it's one of the rich blessings of life. One of my favorite authors is Walker Percy. He has a unique story. Walker Percy began studying as a medical doctor, and during World War II, as he was doing his residency to be a pathologist, he caught tuberculosis, working on a cadaver, and was sent to various sanatoriums in upstate New York to rest for his cure over several years. And all you can do in that situation is read. He came from a very literary family, a southern family, and he read and he read and he read. He read Nietzsche and Sartre and Dostoevsky and Suzanne Langer. And he made two decisions as a result of this. One, he became a follower of Jesus. Two, he gave up medicine to become a writer. And he would often reflect on the similarities of his calling as a pathologist and his calling as a novelist. He said the pathologist begins with a hunch, something's wrong. And the reason they know something is wrong is that there's a dead person in front of them. And they think something killed this person. And they poke around trying to identify and name the malady. He said, that's what I do as a novelist. I have this hunch that there's something that's gone a little askew in human nature, the human condition, the contemporary culture, and I, and I poke around with a different set of tools. And I tried through the writing of fiction to name, to find, identify, and articulate the malady. The doctor as a diagnostician, the writer as a diagnostician. This concept of becoming a diagnostician ought to strike us as gospel people as part of our calling. So today I'm talking about becoming a gospel diagnostician. This is our calling as Christian intellectual leaders in every culture shaping institution. If you have your New Testament with you, flip over to Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 17. I'm reading from the New American Standard because it's the Bible I have with the biggest font. This is a great encounter with Jesus. One day he was teaching and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea from Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. Immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, went home glorifying God, and they were all struck with astonishment. A great encounter with Jesus. Now, besides Jesus, there are four people or groups of people here. First, there are the scribes and the Pharisees. And what are they doing? They are sitting in judgment on what God is doing. They don't approve. This is not the way God acts. 
Whenever we read an encounter with Jesus, a fruitful question to ask is, who am I in the story? When am I like these people? When am I like these people? When am I like the scribes and Pharisees? Where I have my constraints about what I think God is like and what God is about and what it means to follow him. And something he is doing doesn't fit in and I sit in judgment. The second group is the crowd. The crowd really wants to hear Jesus. But they present an obstacle to others coming to the presence of Jesus. The crowd, you could say, they were so intent on their own listening to Jesus, they could not make room for anyone else. They were so intent on their own development or spiritual life or hearing this great teacher that they wouldn't move aside. They wouldn't make room to bring others into the presence of Jesus. When am I like that? Then there's the paralytic. The paralytic needs to be in the presence of Jesus so Jesus can do what only he does, but he can't get there on his own. Often, I'm like that. But to me, the heroes of the story are the men who carried him. Mark tells us there were four, which makes sense if you're carrying a stretcher. Four guys picked up the paralytic and carried him to Jesus. We have no idea of the details of the story, but it very well could have happened something like this. How far did they carry him? We don't know. Was it 100 feet? Probably more. Was it a couple of villages over? Maybe. Somehow they had heard that Jesus was in this place and they had heard that Jesus can do amazing things and they thought we have to get our friend into the presence of Jesus so Jesus can do what only he can do. And we've gotta make it happen. Maybe there was one of them who came up with the idea and rallied his friends. Come on, we gotta get him in, we gotta put him in the stretcher, we gotta carry him. Where are we going? It's only three villages over. That's gonna take all day. Well, you weren't doing anything anyway, <laughs> right? Just close your computer, we're gonna carry the guy into the presence of Jesus. And so they begin to carry him. Well, it gets heavy. 100 feet, 200 feet, 500 feet, a mile, two miles. And probably, they're like, well, let's just put him down. We're tired of this. No, let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep going. We can do this. Then they get to the house. All right, let's bring them in. Can't get there. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but when I picture this scene, and I, and I picture the house, I picture the houses on the Flintstones. You know, the kinds that, with the big round open windows and, and the door, I, I don't know why. I mean, because clearly, scientifically, the Flintstone houses are caveman houses, right? <laughs> They're not um, Second Temple Judaism type houses, but somehow I confuse this in my mind. And I, and I think of them trying to get through the door, but the crowd is there, and then trying to get through the window, but the crowd is there, and then going around back. And then they sit down and they strategize. How are we gonna get in? Because you know they didn't say, let's go through the roof as the first thing. You know that's the last resort. So they sit down, how are we gonna do it? And they, they, one of them says, well, let's scream fire. Clear out the crowd. Well, let's just ask the crowd nicely to move out of the way. Let's push our way through the crowd. Maybe we can drop some spiders in the crowd. I mean, how are we gonna get this crowd to get out of the way? They are so focused on themselves, they can't make room for someone else. You know that they thought, and they sat down, and they strategized, and probably they gave up. Finally, someone looked up, we can go through the roof. No, we can't do that. Sure we can. No, paralytic is saying, no, that's how I got paralyzed. <laughs> I was, I was going to patch my roof, and I'm, 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 
up on the ladder, looking, just looking at it, and in my mind I'm thinking, can I get up there and, and patch this hole on my roof? My neighbor is driving by, stops the car, rolls down the window, and he says to me, Greg, if you have to think about it, don't do it. <laughs> And I said, Dave, you just saved my life. And I got down and I thought, I finally got some young guy to run up there and, and do it. Someone with skills, bow hunting skills, you know. Um, <laughs> we can go through the roof. We can't. Sure we can. We can remove the tiles, dig through. And, and they had to make a big hole, right? Because you, you had to let them down horizontally. You can't let them down vertically. It goes, right? Horizontally, and you're pretty sure it's not the paralytic guy's idea. We've got to get our friend into the presence of Jesus. What makes these guys heroes to me is that they diagnosed the obstacles to getting their friend to the presence of Jesus, and they would not stop till they overcame the obstacles. That's what it means to be a Christian intellectual leader, to be a Christian servant everywhere we go. What are the obstacles to the gospel capturing the core identities of the people around us, and how do we get over them? This works for immediate obstacles in evangelism, in conversation, but we also remember our thinking about the progress of the gospel four-dimensionally. What are the obstacles that are coming up 100 years from now? What do we need to begin to overcome? And what do we sow to in culture so that people can get into the presence of Jesus more readily because the culture is not pushing them away? Now, what's interesting about becoming a gospel diagnostician, unlike a pathologist, and maybe unlike a novelist, is we're not only trying to identify obstacles, we're trying to identify points of receptivity. Because there are things in our culture that are fertile soil for the gospel. And we wanna get behind these movements. And we wanna fan into flame the sparks of reality and goodness and truth and beauty that we find. So our diagnostic work is not just what's bad, but what's good. What are the things that could become preparatory for the gospel, either in individuals, in institutions, in the culture? We need to become diagnosticians. We need to learn how to identify, find these things, and work on them. So I'm gonna give you three conceptual pictures about diagnostics. The first one I call upstream and downstream. Think about culture like a river. What gets dumped in the river upstream affects what happens downstream. This is why the culture shaping institutions have so much power, because they shape the culture. They shape the desires of everyone downstream. The aspirations, the deep sense of what does it mean to be a person, what is worth living for, is shaped by what goes on upstream. Think about this picture. And it's not just identifying the pollution that comes downstream, but it's, but it's identifying what would be rich, oxygen-infused stuff to bump, dump into a river so that the health spreads downstream. What are the things that could be good and what are the things that need to be pulled out? So if you have a literal river and something bad gets dumped in and the fish start going belly up, there are two things you can do. You can go downstream and try to rescue the fish or you can go upstream and try to fix what's being dumped in the river. I think the calling of Jesus on our lives is both. That's the mission of the church. We, we wanna rescue people who are affected by things that they don't even understand that make it hard for them to live authentic human lives because they're disconnected from God. And we wanna enter the culture-shaping institutions to help make it the case, not just that bad stuff doesn't get 
dumped in the cultural stream, but that what the culture shaping institution produces works for the flourishing of human persons, restores their dignity, protects the weak. This is part of our calling. Upstream and downstream. We started thinking about this. Um, I started thinking about this in the year 1979 when Dave Horner and I were new staff with Campus Crusade wandering around the University of Minnesota not knowing what we were doing, but we were pretty sure we were freezing to death, <laughs> trying to do ministry, and we kept talking about culture. How do we begin to reshape the culture so it reshapes the audience for the gospel? We started that conversation 35 years ago, and it's still going on. First picture, upstream, downstream. Second picture, I call it incoming, outgoing questions. Incoming, outgoing questions. You think about someone who comes in and someone who goes out. Now, into what? Well, a conversation. Someone starts a conversation and then they leave the conversation. As a teacher, I think about my classes. Where are my students when they come in? Where do I want them to be when they go out? A university, what, what are they like when they come in as first year students? What, what are they like when they go out? I have to ask these questions, I have to diagnose. What are the things that are shaping the loves, the affections, the aspirations of people when they enter my sphere of influence? And wh where do I want them to be when they go out? So for students, for instance, you might not know this, but students mostly think about their lives under the category of pleasure. I want them to think about their lives under the category of virtue. So I think about that every semester. How do I help students begin to think that it's virtue that ought to shape my aspirations rather than pleasure? How do I hold up a picture of virtue that this is the good life? That the morally good life is the humanly good life. That's my job as a Christian teacher. Because I want them to walk out thinking about their lives in terms of categories that are closer to the truth, closer to reality, and that are closer to God even if they never come to Christ. It's better for them to think about virtue. So I write on the board in many of my philosophy classes, what kind of person should I be? I write that question on the board. And I explain how that connects to every philosophical question. What is reality? What does it mean to be a human person? Political philosophy, how do we work well together? Ethics, are there moral, um, objective moral claims on our lives? Is God real? Everything connects to the question, what kind of person should I be? That's the question I want students to lie awake at night and worry about. So I know they're not thinking about it when they come in. My hope is that some of them do when they leave, incoming, outgoing. Think about your field, your discipline. Many of you aspire to be faculty. Sociology, what's the discipline like now? What should it be like in 50 years? Such that what goes on in sociology helps not just the content, but the assumptions, the methodologies, what counts as a fact, what counts as good research, shapes the institution so that it's not raising up obstacles to the gospel, but it's opening up receptivity to the gospel. What needs to be replaced and overthrown? What needs to be rehabilitated? I have a list, and I'm not gonna go through the whole list. One of the things I think needs to be overthrown is what I call moral atomism. So uh, the, the Greek atomists thought that reality was made up of these little particles that bumped into each other. 
And, and, and the word Adam comes from unable to be split. So to talk about splitting the atom is the ultimate oxymoron, right? These little particles bump into each other, and that's all interaction is bumping into each other. Well, some of that philosophy has permeated our culture, but we live in a culture that, that where we're morally atomistic. And by that I mean, we have a culture where people think my moral decision I make today is like a little particle. It's, un, it's its own unit. I, I eat, make a moral decision, and then tomorrow I make another moral decision, and these two things aren't connected. And then I make another. Every moral decision is a, an absolutely unique, unrelated choice I have. So that means at any point in time, I can decide to begin choosing virtuously. That's just false about human psychology. My ability to choose what's right depends on how I habituate myself in my moral choices. Every moral choice I make makes it easier for me to choose along one path rather than another. I'm training myself to become one kind of person or another. What kind of person should I be? What kind of person am I becoming? Because I am truly becoming one kind of person or another. One of the things I think need to be overthrown is the pervasive cultural assumption of moral atomism. We need for people to understand that we are becoming a certain kind of person. If I'm not training myself before I get married to be faithful, I'm training myself to be unfaithful. Walking down the aisle and saying some words that to be honest you won't remember, anyway, doesn't change your moral character. We habituate ourselves into faithfulness, into kindness, into gentleness. And we cooperate with the work of the Spirit in our lives. So that's a, just an example of something I think we should be overthrown. If we had a lot of time, I'd give you a big list. Incoming, outcoming. So we've got a culture like a stream. We've got this incoming, outcoming picture. The third is what I call fulcrum concepts. There are certain concepts that are like fulcrums. Is that the plural of fulcrum? Oh, I kind of want to say full cry or some Latin thing, but fulcrums. But anyway, um, you know, the fulcrum you, is the center point or the, or the key point, the hinge point of a lever. And we need to be able to diagnose fulcrum concepts. And a, a fulcrum concept is something that is pervasive either in your work, in your field, in your relationships, something about which the gospel speaks deeply and directly. And that's where we need to do our best thinking. Here's a couple of examples. What does it mean to be a human person? From the beginning to the end, the scriptures is about what it means to be a human person. We're made in the image of God. We're given a task to cultivate the garden. All the way at the end, we have the garden and the city merged in the book of Revelation. What it means to be a person. Every academic discipline almost is dealing directly with what it means to be a human person. It's a fulcrum concept. It's a concept about which there's a lot of discussion. It's a gospel concept. That tells us we need to direct our best thinking to this. There are other fulcrum concepts. What is the flourishing life? What is beauty? What is goodness? These fundamental questions are strategic for our diagnostics. So I'm just giving you a slideshow of a couple of conceptual pictures. Think about the stream. Think about the revolving door. Pe people come in, they go out. Think about the fulcrum. If we're gonna take the thick gospel seriously, we are gonna have to become diagnosticians. We're gonna have to dig so deeply into the gospel that we see reality through the gospel lens. 
and we begin to see our work, our families, our neighbors, our leisure, our rest through the gospel lens. These three things are all connected. For you as Christian intellectual leaders, the question is, how am I going to inhabit the culture-shaping institutions that I will inhabit? And you are on a trajectory to inhabit culture-shaping institutions, whether it's education or politics or law or film or the university. How are you going to inhabit these things? My encouragement to you is dig deeply into the gospel in all of its riches, that's what we talked about on Tuesday, and then to become a diagnostician. My, one of my colleagues says it this way, we want to inhabit the culture-shaping institutions with the mind and the mission of Christ. That's our calling. So what do you do now? I want you to think about the next 50 years of your life. Some of you won't have 50 years. Some of you will. I won't. What vision is God beginning to open up to you? We have got to get our friend into the presence of Jesus so Jesus can do what only he does. That's what the four men we're thinking. What vision is God beginning to open up in your life? Think about it, pray about it, dream about it. Cultivate an aggressive learning spirit about it. What might your life be like in 25 years if God establishes these paths for you? One, what vision is God beginning to open? Two, how will you become the person who can engage and accomplish that vision? What do you need to become that person? Spiritual formation, education, experience, training. God doesn't waste any experience in your life if you bring it to him. What cross-cultural experience do you need? What languages do you need to learn? What degrees do you need? Go after it. Be a permanent learner. How will you become the person? Third, whom can you learn from? From whom are you going to learn what it means to inhabit your slice of the pie with the mind and mission of Christ? Who is 20 years ahead of you that you can get to know and pick their brains? Think, what does it take? What have been the challenges? What can you tell me about where I am in my life? Be an aggressive learner, find mentors. Fourth, with whom will you pursue it? Who are the people that you are gonna share this vision with? It took four to bring one in the story we looked at. Think about who are the people I want to pursue the vision God is unfolding in my life with. Who are those people? Some of them are in this room with you. You say, these are the people I want to track with. This is why Horner and I are still friends. It's not that we're that likable, trust me, right? It's because we've been on this path together. How do we influence? How do we think? How do we bring the gospel to bear? And somehow we both wound up in philosophy. And we're doing it parallel. Who are those people? Begin thinking about it now. You will not do it alone. You were not meant to do it alone. You won't make it alone. Think about the one guy trying to pick up the mat. One corner. Who's going to pick up the other corners? Find those people. Begin praying, God, bring me to people that have a similar vision that I can track with. This is what's going to make the difference. One of the best books ever written is Peter Brown's biography of Augustine. In one of the chapters, the first sense, sentence is, Augustine was never alone. And it's talking about how he always gathered people around him of like mind, and these people became the leaders of the church throughout North Africa. 
Find those people. And lastly, what are your next steps? What do you need to do this afternoon? Tomorrow, next Tuesday. A year from now, you don't wanna be in the same place you are now. You want to have a deeper sense of what is the vision God is calling me to do? What, what has he built into me? How am I going to become this person? Where are my mentors? Where are my partners? And how do I step out in faith and act in such a way that I'm faithfully following the path he has for me? The gospel is infinitely richer than we can ever know. The mission is infinitely broader than we can ever know. God wants us to take everything we have and diagnose the obstacles upstream and downstream. Diagnose the opportunities upstream and downstream. Find the people who will help you do it. Live your lives in community with them. And 50 years from now, tell the next generation to do the same thing. Let me pray for you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.